So Charles, thanks for having me for this talk. BRCA, of course, is a story that uh, deals predominantly with breast, uh, inheritable uh, breast and ovarian cancers, but a very interesting homolog, another story that's similar to it, has arisen out of, um, out of the glioblastoma work that's under, been underway for about a decade. And one of the most remarkable things about this particular story is about how personal hubris uh, on my part uh, led me to totally miss this story, to write it off. And uh, it's amusing in retrospect, humbling. Uh, but about just how badly wrong I was about it. So I want to talk a little bit about that personal pathway and tell you um, the story about IDH and bracha -ness. To begin with, uh, I'm going to go through a fairly fundamental uh, basic analysis of what happens uh, in neuro-oncology. And I apologize if this is somewhat pedantic, but I think that the, the principles are so important it's worth spending a little bit of time with. So what you see in the columns here are the three, uh, three well-known grades of uh, diffuse glia astrocytomas. And I distinguish that from, say, for instance, grade one pilocytic astrocytoma, very, very different biology. All of the factors are completely different in that tumor. But these are hemisphere, typically uh, diffuse astrocytomas in adults. So what you see in the bottom is a uh, T2 flare image, which basically demonstrates in an imaging way um, some of the fundamental biologic characteristics of tumors, of these tumors. So in the left anterior temporal, medial left uh, temporal lobe there, you can see in the low-grade astrocytoma that there's an area of mild uh, tissue expansion. It's a little bit bright on flare. Uh, it doesn't show any surrounding vasogenic edema, which is very, very important. It kind of fades off posteriorly uh, into the brain tissue. And then if you look above at the post-contrast T1 image, you see that there's no contrast enhancement within that tumor. So basically what this represents is the imaging findings of the biologic features of low-grade astrocytoma where there's an increase in cell density, but no vascular proliferation, no evidence of necrosis, et cetera. Now, when you move to grade three astrocytoma, again in the flare image below, this particular patient uh, who was biopsy proven to have grade three uh, had this signal abnormality, but again, not a lot of evidence of vasogenic edema. And I want to point out from, because I love this imaging stuff, but I just want to point out that appearance in the, the low grade and the grade three, that's what tumor looks like on flare as compared to glioblastoma, which we'll get to in a moment, where that really bright finger-like appearance is actually a vasogenic edema plus some infiltrating tumor cells. But in the case of the grade three astrocytoma, after the patient was given uh, gadolinium, there was solid nodular contrast enhancement within that lesion, which of course uh, refers to the fact that, or is uh, due to the fact that the patient now has uh, angiogenesis in this lesion, and that would be another key factor kind of demonstrating that the tumor's uh, picking up a more aggressive nature. On the far right is uh, the very well-known feared and uh, terrible glioblastoma. You can see um, that here we uh, have a lot of vasogenic edema. You can see it going down into the optic chiasm. Uh, there is tumor infiltration wherever you see edema and further on. And then in the contrast image, there's peripheral contrast enhancement with central necrosis, a sine qua non feature of glioblastoma. And what you have here is not only blood vessel proliferation, but the tumor outgrowing its metabolic supply. And these are all key features of, uh, of glioma. Now, one of the important things to say about low-grade tumors is, is that the, uh, that appearance on MRI scan is by no means proof that it's a low-grade tumor. So it is very common to see, uh, and it was the case in this patient, that um, this tumor uh, rapidly uh, became grade three astrocytoma. The fact that when we biopsied it, we found he was 56 years old, which is uh, I want to come back to in a minute. When we biopsied that tumor, we found what the pathologist diagnosed as grade two astrocytoma, but the tumor was in an active phase of undergoing anaplastic transformation to grade three, which became apparent within six months. The absence of contrast enhancement doesn't prove low-grade tumor. So you have to biopsy the lesion. You can't watch it and say, oh, it looks like a low-grade tumor. We'll watch it. 
On the other side, the presence of contrast enhancement in a biopsy proven low grade tumor means it's not low grade. So it's one of the really high risk features that we think about in a histologically diagnosed low grade tumor. If it's got contrast enhancement and it's a diffuse astrocytoma, you better think of it as a grade three right out the door because it's gonna act like a grade three. Similarly, with the presence of edema, edema again is a marker of uh, transudation of fluid out into the brain tissue, which means that abnormal blood vessels vessels are being actively formed in the tumor. Peak age incidence, um, 30s, 40s, 50s to 60s. And that's a very interesting thing. Another feature that's very interesting is, is that when you have a low-grade tumor, the likelihood of transitioning to high-grade tumor over time goes up rapidly. When you reach 45 years of age in a patient with a low-grade tumor, there's a 50-50 chance that the patient's got grade three when you, bi when you biopsy a, a non-enhancing tumor. And so one of the well-known features about these low grades, and in part why we worry so much about them and why we treat them aggressively now at, at the time of diagnosis, is because of this well-known tendency to slide from the left side of the slide to the right side of the slide, presumably as additional genetic changes are picked up in these tumors uh, to drive some of the features. So when we see glioblastoma, where there was a known low-grade component, as you know, that's called secondary glioblastoma, that represents about 25, about 20% of glioblastomas, and it's one pathway to the formation of GBM. The other 80% are in older patients typically, and they have so-called de novo glioblastoma, such at the time of first symptoms, uh, the tumor clearly is, uh, is a very high grade. The genetic pathways that underlie the progression of the uh, formation of those two uh, is very interesting and gets to this story uh, that I want to tell you about IDH1. So back in the day when I was running a basic science laboratory and doing tumor genetics, we did a lot of single gene analysis looking at mutations. My, my lab worked a lot on the, the RB gene, uh, and we showed that it was key to the transition between low and high grade tumor, but it was uh, blunt work. It was really hard. We did one gene at a time. And it was really hard to understand the distribution of genetic changes that were actually occurring in these tumors because it was a very reductionist approach, gene by gene approach. The Cancer Gene Atlas, TCGA, took a completely different view of this and basically in 30 different cancer types with a large number of tumors in each one of those cancer types, they did next generation sequencing and it was only then that the sort of broad spectrum of genetic changes uh, underlying the formation of these tumors actually uh, became apparent. So the TCGA had a number of really fundamental findings in it. First of all, before TCGA, it was widely assumed that there were about 100,000 protein encoding genes in each somatic cell. By the time TCGA had done its work, that number had been reduced fivefold. We now believe, or fourfold, there, we now believe that there are 28,000 actively, uh, or, or genes that would uh, encode proteins within each cell. And the TCGA, because it took this global view of all the genetic changes that were occurring across the exon, the exome, the exons, uh, discovered that there were about 30 to 60 genes that were abnormal on average in a cancer cell. And of course, that varies widely. I'm going to show you some data on that in a minute. It varies widely from uh, a few changes to a very, very large number of changes. But on average, it's about 30 to 60. And that's less, you know, when I was sort of growing up in neuro-oncology, that's fewer gene mutations or, or, or um, um, uh, alterations than I, I would have thought. I would have thought it would have been much higher than that. But it, whoa, that was really cool. Has this thing got a pointer? Was that it? Oh, <laughs> too high tech. So it turns out that there's a bunch of different kinds of mutations. And TCGA was fundamental in this, because instead of looking at the RB gene, I did that for five years. It's the only gene I looked at, right, and the, the complex. Now we could actually look at the wide spectrum of changes occurring. And so it turns out that the vast majority of genetic changes in these 30 to 60 gene alterations are actually what are known as passenger mutations. They're actually mutations that occur. You can detect them, but they're not actually contributing to the neoplastic phenotype. 
Then moving upstream at that in terms of types of, of uh, mutations, there are driver mutations, which are fundamentally important to the development and uh, growth of the tumor. And a driver mutation basically uh, is any mutation in the tumor which is fundamentally important to selective growth advantage for that tumor cell. That's how a, a driver mutation uh, is um, is defined. So some, some driver mutations, typically a small number, tons of passenger mutations, and then founder mutation is sort of a, uh, it's not the right concept in tumor genetics, but IDH1 is gonna be an example of that that I'm gonna tell you the story of in just a minute, and it is an example of one of the earliest driver mutations that are seen in the formation of brain tumors, and so if you will, we would expect every tumor cell in the patient's tumor to be dependent upon that early driver mutation that's responsible for helping to, to, to form the tumor. So as I think everybody in the room is well aware, uh, these genes can be alternatively classified as things that promote tumor growth or whose normal function is to inhibit growth, but when they're inactivated, then they allow growth to occur. Those are called, of course, of course are called tumor suppressor genes. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. But interestingly enough, if you look from the TCGA at the distributions of kinds of base or, or a DNA alterations, in these genes, the vast majority of them, vast majority are single base substitutions. So that's the blue column in each one of those types of tumors. You can see over here with glioblastoma, single base substitutions, that's the big deal. You've got some translocations, very few, deletions, amplifications, insertions, deletions. But the real story is with single base pair substitutions. And the reason that is so important from the TCGA analysis, gotta look broadly across all these genes, is, is that since single base substitutions arise from mistakes of DNA replication, that's the cause of cancer right there. It, it's very, very informative in terms of understanding how the one per million base pair error rate leads to large numbers, large numbers of single base substitutions in cancer cells, and that then, when it hits a driver mutation, is what leads to the formation of the tumor. So this single base substitution story is very, very interesting. Uh, the number of those kinds of alterations, as you can see on the chart, um, varies by different times of tumor, to, uh, by various tumor types. And as you can imagine, all of those genetic changes in the tumor cells, except for the passenger mutations, which typically have no function. They're just passengers, but we believe. But in, in, in essence, what those changes are doing are driving the tumor uh, from the left side of this screen to the right side of the screen, and they're involved in interesting things like proliferation, survival, formation of new blood vessels, uh, blocking the immune system uh, by cytokine release into the tumor. All of the things, that those characteristics that we think of being in a successful tumor derive in large part from genetic alterations or epigenetic alterations. However, in the last 10 years, some really new alternative oncogenic pathways, other than cell proliferation and you know that uh, 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 abrogation of apoptosis, have emerged. And interestingly enough, it emerged from the story of glioblastoma and IDH1. This has been really fundamentally important. It's a completely new era uh, area of. Um, oncogenesis and we can you know we can be proud that that came out of our area rather than say you know just one more colon cancer success obviously we like successes but i'm talking scientifically let me talk a little bit about because this becomes important about the idh1 story let me talk a little bit about the ways in which oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes a comparison of how, of how they're altered so in an oncogene the definition of an oncogene is a gene that derives one of these cellular features that makes the tumor cells survive. <clears throat> and in general, it's actually almost an absolute rule. What happens is, is that that gene is inactivated by a point mutation or it's altered by a point mutation in the gene and that hotspot point mutation is seen over and over and over again. So typically this would be an enzyme. Uh, in the case of uh, both of these oncogenes that I've shown here, IDH1 is the one we're most interested in today. And so what's happening is, is that there's a arginine to histidine single base substitution that leads to that, that codon, that uh, amino acid change. It always happens in exactly the same codon and it turns out that that amino acid is, is uh, very, very strongly, uh, well, it's right in the middle of the catalytic domain of the IDH1 enzyme. 
And what it does is, is that it knocks the enzyme out. That's really weird, because typically what happens in oncogenes is, is when you have a point mutation in the catalytic domain, it leads to constitutive activation of the gene. And now, for example, like, you know, MYC or something like that, it's saying divide, divide, divide. This is an inactivating point mutation that's seen over and over again, but it actually inactivates the protein rather than activating it. So already this IDH1 story is looking really odd. There's something funny going on here. If, on the other hand, you look at tumor suppressor genes, they're inactivated by all kinds of mutations all over the place. Here's, here's another really important factor. See the, the missense versus truncating mutation. These, by, by definition, need to be the, the oncogenes. They have to be missense mutations, which change an amino acid but don't terminate the protein. Whereas in tumor suppressor genes, where the goal of the tumor cell is to knock out the function of the protein in any way possible, both missense and truncating mutations are seen all over the genes. So here's VHL, RB1, another very, very well-known example. And again, I want to come back to the fact that IDH1, something funny is going on with IDH1. And it is an absolutely fascinating new area in, uh, in oncology. Now, I know you've already seen this slide at least once a day. Theoretically, this is the most shown slide in uh, cancer genetics, and basically it says from the cancer genome analysis, TCGA, uh, they looked at the distribution of mutations across various kinds of cancer, and um, there's some really, really interesting things. Most people just kind of show this slide and say, look, melanoma's got more mutations than gliomas, but there's a lot more subtle information in that than here than that. So the first thing to look at here, and again, this, this is a little bit on the general side, but I'm getting ready to drive through to the IDH1 story uh, soon enough. If you look at the, all right, here we go. Uh, if you look at the uh, tumors that have, on average, the highest number of mutations per megabase, interestingly enough, and perhaps not surprisingly, they are all uh, carcinogen-related tumors. Melanoma, highest mutated tumor in the human body, ultraviolet light. Lung cancer, lung cancer, bladder cancer, lung cancer, all smoking related, heavily smoking related. So if you're pouring carcinogens into your body, or allowing them to, not here perhaps, but uh, you know, you're allowing the, the, the sun to do a number on your skin, particularly in young age, uh, the high number of mutations that are produced by those um, those mutagens lead to this pattern of ending up on the far end. Notice this is a log scale over on the left-hand side. And uh, Dr. Marker uh, referred to this a moment ago, but here's where you get the most neoantigens, a neoantigen being an abnormal protein from a mutated uh, normal uh, gene, and the cell's supposed to recognize that as foreign and get rid of it, and very, very high number of neoantigens in melanoma, and all of those tumors are the ones that are most likely to respond to immunotherapies. I was very surprised when I saw this slide because I always thought glioblastoma, it's the nasty, you know, it's like we vie for pancreas cancer docs versus, you know, uh, neuro-oncologists as to who has the, the most dangerous tumor, bless you. And um, turns out that gliomas actually sit pretty low on the mutation burden spectrum. And look at old pilocytic astrocytoma down there at the far left-hand side. It's barely got any mutations in it at all. So there's this, there's this thing that, you know, this pattern that goes up with the um, number of uh, mutagens. But the other interesting thing to look at is, is that in some of these cases, not all of them, they're also related to the number of cells turning over in that potential, in that, in that organ. So we think of breast cancer as being, you know, 100 times more common than brain tumors, maybe more. In part, that's because there's a lot of cell activity where those single base substitution errors can occur and lead to cancer. In the brain, we've got a few uh, progenitor cells along the ventricles which are turning over from time to time, and those are probably the ones that get the mutations in them, et cetera. The other thing that's really interesting about this is, is that people always show the, the sort of the median, the line going up, but look at the variation for each one of those tumors. It's very, very high. So yeah, glioblastoma has tenfold less mutations in it on average than melanoma does, but the number, the, the range of those mutations is actually very high. And so we don't want to forget about the fact that it may not be a high mutation burden tumor on average, but for some patients it is. 
So um, this, is a, this is a flow diagram that I know everybody's seen many times. It gets changed every so often, and it changed a lot when the IDH1 story came out. And the way this is, this has now been incorporated into the uh, WHO classification revision. And so for uh, a presumed um, uh, stem cell sitting in the brain somewhere, if you don't, if it doesn't start with an IDH1 mutation, that's how you get to primary glioblastoma. If there is a mutant IDH1 gene, then you either go down the 1P19Q pathway to oligos, that's now required to make that diagnosis, or you go down the, TP, the, uh, the P53 pathway to get to diffuse astrocytoma, and then ultimately to secondary glioblastoma. But at secondary glioblastoma, we still see the IDH1 mutants. So what is this IDH1 story? It's absolutely fascinating. So I first read about this in 2008. I saw that I think it was a science paper. And um, IDH, isocitrate dehydrogenase, is a Krebs cycle enzyme. There is no way in Earth that a Krebs cycle enzyme could have anything to do with oncogenesis. That just doesn't make any sense. And I thought, well, that's another one of these passenger mutation stories that aren't going aren't to matter, right? So uh, this was discovered to be present in a lot of gliomas. And then on subset analysis, it turned out that almost all low-grade uh, gliomas carry them. Primary glioblastoma does not. And here's a crazy thing. When you have an IDH1 mutation, you got two alleles of the gene. One is mutant, one is wild type. Typically what happens is, is that when something's trying to inactivate uh, a problem, if, the, if, the, if you're trying to inactivate a gene, you'll get changes in each allele. But in this particular case, this was a, a mutant wild type, heterozygote. And so there was a wild type copy of the gene, and then this highly conserved mutation in the catalytic domain was seen as a hotspot mutation. And in 98% of people, it's either R132H, so 131st amino acid, uh, changes from an arginine to a histidine, which interestingly enough is a conserved mutation in the sense that they're both, um, they're both um, hydrophilic uh, amino acids. And occasionally the gene IDH2, which is in the mitochondria, IDH1 is cytosolic. Occasionally IDH1 mutations are seen. But again, it's interestingly enough, it's in the same place in the catalytic domain and it's an arginine to histidine. So this was really interesting. I wrote it off. I thought, you know, um, there's just no way that that's going to be important. Well, here's the story that unfolded over the ensuing decade and actually opened an entire new area of oncometabolos. Let's see, i got to have a word for this. Oncometabolosis. Uh, okay, that's clumsy, but you know what I'm saying. So it turns out that what, I, what uh, uh, IDH1 and its wild type form does is it converts isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate. Alpha That's what it's supposed to do. And if you have an IDH1 homodimer that, that makes two, one copy uh, is wild type, one copy is wild type, when those homodimers function as their normal enzymatic activity, you get alpha-ketoglutarate. If you get a wild type mutant homodimer, if you will. Now it's sort of a heterodimer, but you know what I mean. IDH1, IDH1, one copy's mutant, because remember, only one of the genes is mutant. You get that uh, mutant homodimer on one copy. Not, not only does it no longer make alpha-ketoglutarate, but it makes a new compound, not previously really well understood in cell metabolism at all, called 2-hydroxyglutarate, which is shown here. And so the mutant wild type homodimer forms this new, this new molecule. And it turns out that what that does is, is that all the stuff that alpha-ketoglutarate alpha does in the cell, it screws it up. So whatever alpha-keto, and we're going to talk about that next, whatever alpha-ketoglutarate does, 2-hydroxyglutarate inhibits the normal function of alpha-ketoglutarate. So Alrighty, lots and lots of weird things. We've got this, like, you know, this uh, citric, in, this, uh, you know, um, um, Krebs cycle enzyme playing a role in oncogenesis all of a sudden. It's a wild type mutant thing. It's a point mutation at the same place every time in a catalytic domain. So, what's going on here? Uh, there's a lot of work in vitro uh, and cell culture work, et cetera, but basically, that mutant wild type dimer, 
um, loses its normal ability to make alpha ketoglutarate and it gains a new function to make 2-hydroxyglutarate. That is not a, a well-known, to my knowledge, is not a well-known pathway uh, in enzymology until this was developed and certainly this had never been seen before or considered before in oncogenesis. That is now known as a neomorphic enzyme. It's an enzyme that gets point mutation in it, creates a new metabolite that's called a neomorphic enzyme with an oncometabolite. In this case, the oncometabolite is 2-hydroxyglutarate. So, so far, is that, and I just, well, not a show of hands, but maybe nods, is that, is that concept kind of coming through or because it's key to the next, next part? Okay, great, great. So, brand new stuff, right? Right out of neuro-oncology, we've got all these new things coming along, and I'm still, you know, sort of scratching my head and going, uh-huh, so what's this 2-hydroxyglutarate? And it turns out that it screws up all kinds of normal processes in the cells, but a couple of two hydroxyglutarate mechanisms are really worthy of uh, a little bit of, of, of consideration. So one of the things that two hydroxyglutarate oncometabolite does is, is that it inhibits alpha ketoglutarate dependent oxygenases. And this is getting almost to the limit of my vocabulary here, as you'll notice. I'm not an enzymologist. But alpha ketoglutarate dependent oxygenases do a bunch of things in cells that help to maintain all sorts of cellular homeostasis. It's got energy considerations, it's got lots and lots of different things. But two of the things that are very interesting from the neuro-oncology standpoint is, is that it vastly changes the epigenetic landscape of the cancer cell, and it has a very, very interesting function in altering DNA repair. So on the epigenetic side, and that's not where I'm going to focus my comments, but there's still a ton of work going on in this area. Um, CPG island methylator phenotypes, that's where uh, CPGs get methylated um, on the guanine residue at a, at a very high level compared to normal cells. So it's a methyl group that goes on to the CPG island. And in neuro-oncology, we worry a lot about whether patients have MGMT methylated cells. Well, the MGMT methylated promoter, which shuts down synthesis of MGMT, is a CIMP process. So if you have a IDH1 mutation, you're much more likely to have a tumor with MG, uh, MGMT methylation because it methylates broadly across the genome. The other thing that happens is, is that it also leads to the methylation of histones. And histones, of course, are widely responsible for the uh, um, uh, packing of DNA. And when a histone's sitting on a gene, it can't be expressed. And so the way histones interact with genes is very important in terms of which genes get expressed and which ones don't. And histone binding is regulated by methylation of the C-terminal end of histones, some other areas, and that is uh, you know, a lot of work on this now. That's been dramatically altered if you have this 2-hydroxyglutarate oncometabolite. But what I'm here to talk about today is the change in homologous recombination. This is where the BRCA story comes in. So BRCA, uh, that is a breast and ovarian cancer uh, risk gene. And what that gene does when it's abnormal is, is that it disrupts homologous recombination repair of DNA damage. And so it's a secondary effect, if you will. So BRCA gets mutated. The cell accumulates a lot more mutations because it has this homologous recombination problem. And that homologous recombination defect is known as BRCA-ness. BRCA and it turns out that 2-hydroxyglutarate induces bracha -ness in gliomas. And so now we have this interesting tie to all this work with, you know, with uh, BRCA, BRCA. And the interesting thing about that is, is that there are two related pathways that control the, uh, the two predominant pathways that control DNA repair in the cell are this Brachinus pathway that I just referred to that gets screwed up by these changes that occur in the cell with the, with the oxygenases. And the other pathway is called single, uh, um, um, single base pair excision repair. And that is mediated by an enzyme known as PARP. And so 
The thing that's really exciting in ovarian cancer right now, really exciting, is, is that in women who have ovarian cancer that have BRCA gene knocked out, if you come in with a PARP inhibitor like Olaparib and you knock out PARP, it's what's called a synthetic lethal mutation. A synthetic lethal mutation is when the cell's already got one pathway blocked, there's another pathway sitting there just doing fine, and you come in with a drug and you block the second pathway that's called synthetic lethal. And so in IDH mutant gliomas, the whole idea of that PARP pathway now becomes very, very interesting. I mean, it, it, it's stunning what's going on in ovarian cancer with these, with these PARP inhibitors. They're just, uh, it, it's truly remarkable how much benefit women are gaining from this. And so there are two key concepts that I want to just reflect back on. So one is a neomorphic enzyme and an oncometabolite concept. That's where a mutation changes the function of these proteins in a way that doesn't kill it, but creates an oncometabolite. And for that reason, it's a oncogene, not a tumor suppressor gene. And it has mutations, as you'll recall, in one place every time in the catalytic domain. It's clearly an oncogene. But this time, instead of having a direct pathway to cell proliferation, for example, what's happening in this case is, is that oncometabolite is setting up a, a series of changes that actually allow the, the, the glioma cell to uh, become, um, uh, you know, a, a glial cell to become progenitor cell uh, to become a glioma. And the second big concept is this idea of the synthetic lethal where you have one, path, one of two pathways knocked out by the cell and then you come in with a drug and you inhibit the second pathway and that's called synthetic lethal. It's a very, very interesting concept and um, those are the two, the two big things that I'd like for you to remember from this talk. Fortunately, <coughs> we can detect IDH1 uh, mutant tumors with an antibody. So this antibody was developed in uh, Andreas von Daimling's lab in Heidelberg, and basically what he found, or Berlin, don't quote me, uh, what he found was he created an antibody that recognized the mutant epitope. So if the tumor stains, like on the right side, then you've got the R132H mutation. About 98% of the mutations are in that particular site. And so it's a very easy assay to allow us to determine whether a patient's tumor is IDH1 mutant or not. If the staining is negative, then you have to go in sequence for the other rare mutations. IDH1, IDH2, they've got some really, really interesting phenomena there. Um, uh, IDH1 mutation predicts much better behavior in any glioma than the same glioma by histology that doesn't, that's wild type. It's very, very strong predictive uh, or prognostic. And in addition to that, it's very clear now that it's also predictive in terms of responses uh, to therapy. And so, um, you know, that's pretty interesting, being both prognostic and predictive at the same time. And uh, it's a very, very important uh, feature now of the way we look at these tumors. So um, I wanted to just put this last slide in to talk about, um, well, all right, this looks like a really early driver mutation in these tumors, possibly even sort of like, you know, a founder mutation, which is probably as close to anything in glioma as we know, as the original common mutation in, the, in these low-grade tumors. And so if that's really important, what can we do to tackle that particular pathway to try to alter or improve outcomes? So things get a little bit complicated when you begin to think about this. It turns out that if you have an IDH1 mutation, that's really good for you. So it might be that the last thing on earth we want to do is to go in and alter this IGH1 mutant pathway because maybe that makes you do worse, right? I mean, it could be. Um, interestingly enough, in AML, I've got something up there on AML. On AML, there's currently, turns out that there's about a dozen other tumors that have IDH1 mutation in them. AML is one. And in AML, IDH1 mutations are a bad prognostic factor. So the production of 2-hydroxyglutarate and AML, you want to get rid of it, and there's already a small molecule inhibitor approved to block the IDH1 enzyme in AML. But in gliomas where it's a good prognostic factor and it predicts the fact that patients respond to tumor, it could be counterintuitive to go in and block that, block that enzyme. And so... <coughs> um, 
there's a really good reason not to go in and try that small molecule inhibitor in gliomas. In gliomas, um, uh, there are, uh, there's evidence that uh, if you use a PARP inhibitor uh, or if you use a, a, one of these direct IDH1 inhibitors that they don't get, that the, the, the cells don't die when you irradiate them. And if you use a PARP inhibitor, which kills glioma cells with IDH1 mutation very nicely in a Petri dish, that it protects them against all kinds of things. So we've got good reasons to avoid IDH1 inhibitors in gliomas. Well, okay, so fine. It's also a neoantigen. It's a mutant protein. Mutation gets expressed on the surface of cells in context of MH, MH, um, uh, MHC1. Could we actually use that uh, as a signal that maybe patients would respond better uh, to uh, immunotherapy? So there is currently a study. Uh, these blue ones are... are um, uh, these blue uh, are links to clinicaltrials.gov where studies are being being done, and there's a, a study of a checkpoint inhibitor in patients with IDH1 mutant gliomas, <clears throat> and they get randomized based on whether, according to their mutation burden, there's a high mutation burden or not, hypermutator phenotype. And then uh, there is one study that's been completed with PARP inhibitors that didn't look very exciting, um, and Biopsies of the tissue of the brain tumor showed that the elaparib, it was, I think it was actually velaparib, uh, that velaparib didn't actually penetrate very well into the tumor, although it's a 500, molecule, uh, a 500 Dalton molecule. Uh, but there is uh, one current study um, going on with um, glioma cholangiocarcinoma, which is another IDUH1 mutant tumor. And um, so that study, that study is open. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Don't ignore 80% mutation rates in tumors. That's my take-home message, even if it's in a Krebs cycle. Because you know, you know, the thing about Krebs cycle, I don't think there's a physician in here that doesn't itch when they think about Krebs cycle. <laughs> Had to memorize it. In ADH1, two, um, couldn't be, but it was. John, actually, I do have a question. Has anybody tried confection-enhanced delivery with PARP inhibitors into brain tumors? Um, because you need to get them there, and they really won't go across the blood-brain barrier, the ones that have been looked at, at least. Well, I, I, I don't know. Tara, do you have any idea about that? I, I don't know. It's an interesting idea. Yeah, I haven't seen any studies to that effect. Sean or, or Dan, I don't know if you have either. Um, all the other convection-enhanced delivery attempts really just been proof of concept that you can get drug to target. Um, and that you don't, generally speaking, you don't hurt people. That you, it's, generally speaking, don't hurt right. people. But and out of that, nothing really happens. <laughs> and, and the issue is, is getting it anatomically to, to target, but really what you're doing is just pumping the interstitial space full of this chemical. It doesn't solve the issue of actually getting it into the cell. And when you're talking about a molecular target, whether it's uh, inhibiting a transcription factor or altering a promoter site, if you can't actually get it into the cell, it doesn't matter how you get it there, whether it's you know a, a wafer that you're depositing at the time of surgery or convection-enhanced delivery or oral therapy or IV with or intraarterial blood-brain barrier disruption, you can't get it into the cell, it doesn't matter. And that's really always been the problem in the brain. We should put in one to Jim Marker's viruses. <laughs> That would get it there. Oh, um, uh, I think oncolytic viruses have been given via convection-enhanced delivery, I believe. No, 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 I mean putting a PARP inhibitor oh. in, into oh. so somehow. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, well, I think, yeah, the point is we, need a we may need a, del a different delivery mechanism. Or it could be that this pathway is very pretty, but it won't work. That's another possibility. But we don't know that yet. <laughs>